All right. Well, make sure we're, make sure we're recording here. And we are good. Don't need a slip up from last week. All right. Welcome everybody to this week's Corn Belt Umpires Association Zoom Lunch Clinic. I assume everybody can see my screen right now. Oh. No. Nope. Yep. Okay. Love all these technical difficulties. Revert back to point one, Jake. Share screen. There we go. Okay. Now I think we yeah, there we go. All right. Welcome everybody to this week's uh, presentation. Have a fun topic today. I'm going to talk about working with catchers. Uh, this is a topic that was widely requested, uh, more so handling situations. But um, with that being said, uh, working with catchers is uh, falls right in line with uh, handling situations, as many people will come to understand here shortly. As a reminder, this is recorded, so please keep it as G-rated as possible. Um, Without further ado, um, catchers are what I like to refer to as umpire lifesavers. They are stopping a incredibly fast projectile um, that is uh, can cause serious injury. I know several umpires that have you know either been concussed, broken up limbs, things of that fun nature. Um, so we want to we want to work with catchers. We don't want to make them mad. Um, and we just want to, uh, you know, do our job, let them do our job and know how to diffuse any potential situations that pop up. Um, and I put in here doing business, uh, and we'll learn about more of that, uh, kind of later on. Um, one side note, we're still working on getting all of the details, but I was informed by, uh, Dan Adkins this morning that on, uh, and Connor or Russ, correct me on the date if I'm wrong, but I believe it is the 30th. Yeah, Tuesday, March 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, there will be a Zoom session held with um, former Major League crew chief, uh, Tim Cheetah, who uh, is a St. Paul, Minnesota native. Uh, still resides there um, and our friends from uh, the Twin Cities are uh, putting on a fantastic evening with Tim Cheetah. Look, very much looking forward to it. I hope I can get my nine innings in so I can join uh, right about on time. So first and foremost, let's talk about working with catchers in the pregame, okay? Plate umpire, we take lineup cards, or we should be taking lineup cards for every game. Um, I, I will take lineup cards in a 13U, 14U game uh, because it acts as a piece of scratch paper for me. If a situation should arise that I need to note something. Um, other times, if you look at the back of my lineup cards, they are uh, done in a manner that I understand what's going on but I have notes all over the place. I put my courtesy runners on the back of my lineup cards and I have a, I have a way that I uh, can keep it all organized. But the other purpose is, so you know your catcher's name and first name. So if uh, Connor and I, Connor's a catcher and the plate umpire, when Connor walks up to me before he, the game starts, I already know Connor's name. And the, the higher up you go, the more likely that the catcher will already know your name as well. Okay. I've had high school catchers. I've had college catchers come out. Hey, Jake, how's it going? Never seen this team before. I have no idea who this catcher is. I mean, this catcher's from Arizona or Florida from all, or for all places. But, hey, Jake, how's it going? Um, and, and I know their first name. Same concept with coaches, which we'll kind of 
I think hit on next week, uh, you know, knowing your coaches names before they get to the plate meeting. Uh, this just gives off a more professional appearance. Uh, and it shows that you're, you're committed to what you're doing, but also that you know what you're doing and you're confident. Um, one of the things that I added on here is how do you want to be addressed? I hate, hate being called blue. It is one of my major pet peeves. Um, and if anybody wants to know why Major League Baseball got rid of the Navy blue, um, it is simply because they were sick and tired of their umpires being called blue. And there's a lot of other long history and, and the uh, derogatory nature behind the term, uh, but that's a topic for another clinic. Ump, first name, nickname. Um, for me, it's Ump, if you forget my first name, or uh, Jake. Uh, that's just my personal preference. I'm going to address the catcher by their first name. Uh, so that's a bit of a, it, it's a, it's a two way street, I guess. Um, by me saying, using their first name, I let them use my first name, but I always preface it with, you know, uh, I think I actually get to it here. So now we're, we're at the time where the pitcher's taking warm up pitches. If you don't get behind the catcher of both pitchers for the first inning, you should. Uh, there is no excuse not to. Catchers and pitchers want to get strikes. We want to get strikes. I want to know what this pitcher's throwing so I can be ready come showtime. Okay. Because we looked on the lineup card, we already know our catcher's first name, so use it. Hey, Connor, how's it going today? Bill? Um, were you answering my question? No. I, okay. I, I can't if you want. I mean, it's raining. It went from like 77 yesterday to rain today. So I'm not <laughs> doing great. But um, the one thing I would say here is whenever I introduce myself to coaches or catchers, whether or not I have any idea who they are, hey, Jake, great to see you again. How are you doing today? And that goes into building report. They're like, oh, this guy remembers me. I have no idea who he is, but he remembers me and he seems to like me. So I'm more likely to seem to like him because this guy remembers me. Whether whether or not I do, whether or not I've ever seen him before or not. Right off the bat, it's, oh, hey, this, this guy recognizes me from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't recognize him, so he must not be bad. Because I typically recognize the bad ones. One other reason why you want to say it in a positive way is you could have had an altercation a month ago. Mm -hmm. And you're now opening it up to saying, today's a new day. And whatever happened before, you're ready to work a good game for them. So I think having a positive attitude when you're saying that with or without their first name um, lends lends a lot of credence to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So my my typical conversation with a catcher is I'll introduce myself pre COVID shake hands. Okay, now it's fist bump, elbow bump, whatever. Hey, Connor, how's it going? Good. All right, cool. Uh, my name is Jake. Uh, feel free to call me Jake. Um, that's, I got no problem with that. I always say, use it respectfully. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. Like be smart with it. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey Jake, where you got that. Uh, but if, if you're going to shout my name across the field, cause I just screwed something up. Yeah. We're going to have a problem with that. Um, this is probably, I think the most important thing, um, the higher up you go, obviously the more competitive it gets the catcher. And, and coaches, they want to know that you're there, you're engaged, and you know what you're doing. So I, I always ask, what does this guy, girl have? Okay. And so like, I, I was at a, it was at a college this past weekend, and I got behind every pitcher that was warming up and, hey, Nick, what does this guy got? Well, he's got two, two seam, four seam change of curveball. Nothing, nothing weird. All right, cool. 
can I see the change up and cur like, can I see the change up or can I see the curveball? Okay. Um, one of my favorite interactions with a catcher was an amateur game in uh, Laverne. And some of you guys that work town team ball in Southwest Minnesota will know exactly who I'm referring to. Um, but I just said, Hey, what, what's this guy got? And he's like, well, he doesn't have much, but he's got a knuckleball. Want to see it? Yes, please. Um, so like it, it all goes back to at the end of the day, the catchers want strikes. The last thing that I want to do is have, you know, a bases loaded situation, two outs, you know, where pitchers really trying to work out of a jam on a three, two count and throws a beautiful curveball that I haven't seen yet. And I ball it, even though it was a strike. Get you want to see what they got. Okay. I guarantee you the catcher's gonna throw the curveball, or the pitcher's gonna throw the curveball at some point in time in that warm-up. Ask the catcher, hey, when's it coming? So you can see it. Okay. I've never been told no when I've asked to see a pitch. So talking pre-pitch setup here, um, this is a great chart that I believe Kirk Dahl has put on our website, cornbeltumps.org, um, talking about our, our setup here, okay? Um, we talk about work in the slot, and we'll discuss this more in depth when we um, work um, or when we talk about just your run-of-the-mill plate mechanics. But just a couple, couple things to, to highlight. Um, when we have a catcher set up outside, we're still going to stay in the slot. Okay, we should always be in this green area, no matter what. Okay, we want to be in line, chin in line with the top of the head, and we're looking through the strike zone. Um, if the catcher moves out, we still stay there. That is the safest place to be, okay? Um, and we don't ever wanna be on the other side of the catcher. Typically, um, you know, they'll set up outside or center. If they set up inside, um, the, what, what I always do is I go up. In the, I, I just I get my my chin further up um, because I'm I want to stay in the slot. Um, I don't know if Connor or Russ, you guys have any other um, techniques that you use. Um, the other thing that I will say is there's a particular um, there is a couple catchers that that we have that they like to set up really really late and come inside. If you have that situation and it's not every pitch. Uh, sometimes what you can do is you can ask the catcher, hey, tap my, uh, tap my, what we call the slot foot. So on a, on a uh, right-handed batter, your slot foot's going to be your left foot. Um, or say, hey, if you're coming in late, tap my, tap my left foot. So at least I know you're coming in and I can set up accordingly. And the way that I'm going to set up is not going to tip the, the offense off. But at least I know that you're coming in. Um, you know, it's going to help me see that pitch better. Um, and I'm going to be a lot more accurate. Connor, Russ, any thoughts or anything like that on, you know, getting, getting squeezed or setting up inside? Um, I typically like to talk to the catcher about that pre in my warm-up pitches. Um, I think it's really hard for them to tap your slot foot because that's usually glove hand for them. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to give a target. Yeah. They're probably going to use their throwing hand most of the time to alert you to that. So that's one thing I'll say is just give me some, give me some sort of notice, whatever you can, if, if you can. Mm -hmm. um, number two, if you're going to squeeze him in tight and he's on the line, find a way to give me a window. I don't want to miss that pitch. You don't want me to miss it either. Um, but the really thing, the thing that I think helps me the most when they're running the ball in down the river um, is timing. And, you know, we talk a lot about timing, but, in that situation, slow down a lot because you're you're high and tight to the catcher. You're looking at the strike zone from a slightly different angle, and you have batter the batter's hands going through the zone, going through your line of flight or line of sight, potentially interrupting your vision of that baseball. So really slow down. 
even more than you, than you normally do. Um, and that's what I found to be successful for me. There's, there's six adjustments we can make. One, move over uh, further into the slot or back toward the middle, but not past the middle. So, so move laterally, okay? You can move up, you can move back, you can have more knee bend or less knee bend. You can, uh, oh, there's two more I'm missing. I'm sorry, I wish I remembered them now. I had them before when I was thinking about it. Anyway, that's it. Larry, I know you'll, I know you'll remember it. Just toss it in the chat. We'll come right back to it. Okay. So I guess just to wrap Connor's point up. Russ, what do you got? Or, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, something that I've been trying that I'm having a lot of good success with. And if you go back to your slot mechanic, mm -hmm. um, uh, slide, it'll help me. So upper right, um, where catcher is pinched in and your slot diminishes a lot. I've had great success, even as tall as I am, getting lower, getting below the hands of the batter so that I can see, at the very least, I got to see half, the last half of that pitch. I got to see, you know, I got to see the ball for some point in time. Um, getting low helps me out. It keeps me safe, too. Because Larry's comment, if you go back, you can go back and up. That That is a, another way to do this. Um, and it is helpful. And as long as you stay in that green zone, you're you're not in that danger zone, which is which is what we need. I've just had great success going low. Um, it just almost it just always seems to open up a window for me to see the pitch. And then Connor's dead right. Your timing is, can't hurt you having great timing. Based upon a batter's hands where they are, that's good advice. Uh, but if they're, especially if they're average, uh, you know, at the at the top of the zone, or if they're yeah. above, uh, like yeah. a, what Carl Nostromsky was, uh, if they've got hands low, you might have to start on top, higher up. That's all. Yep, I agree with you. I'll wrap this up by, by saying the, the things not to do, okay? Don't get out on the other side of the catcher. Don't get into the yellow or, or the red zones. And then the other thing I'll say is don't I, – I see this happen when guys get squeezed and when I was a lot more – a lot newer at umpiring, I did it too. Um, I see guys that they will drop into a scissor stance. Uh, don't drop into a scissor stance. Russ has a great idea going low. Uh, and, uh, you know, working up. But the scissor stance is no longer, I'm going to say, taught and approved. Russ, correct me if I'm wrong. It's no longer approved for use in minor league baseball. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I believe I've heard that as well. Um trying to think i know there's a couple big league guys that still do it but i don't believe that they i don't jerry, believe they'll allow it jerry meals yeah. cb buckner not, and vic Carapaz, i think are the first. right and i know i know i know jeff still uses it too jeff does okay yeah so the the scissor stance is more is it's very dangerous to use uh, there's a reason they're not teaching it anymore, um, and we're, we'll, I think we'll talk about that when we talk about you know plate mechanics and and what a proper um, heel toe or a, uh, the hands on knees Jerry Davis stance looks like. Um, we'll talk foul balls here. Um, so, do you throw the ball or do you hand the ball to the catcher? Well, my answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on if where my catcher is at, if it's just one of those that just rockets out of the ballpark 
and my catcher still stand in front of me, I'll probably just hand it to him. If it's one of those where it, it goes up the line and foul, or I'm going up the line on a fair foul situation, I will throw the ball back to the pitcher. Okay. Now the one Achilles heel that I see with throwing the ball back is we've all seen it. And frankly, if you throw it back, we've all probably had the throws where we spike it into the ground or where we throw it 20 feet over their head. If you're going to throw it, make sure you do, make sure it's a good throw. Um, <clears throat> one, it'll make you look more um, athletic and it may, uh, it, and it, it should in theory help, um, you know, at least make it look like you can look like you belong, shall we say, uh, at least you, at least you can throw a baseball. Um, so typically I hand, I hand the ball to the catcher, um, unless I'm up the line or, um, on a home run. Uh, Russ, Larry, Connor, any thoughts on that? Anything to add? If he leaves or I leave, I throw it. If we stay, I'm letting him throw it back. I suggest yep. you all get into the habit of giving it to the catcher because someday your arm won't be any good. Or it's going to be a real cold day and you don't, you hurt your arm, or it's that, that cold that you can't get it there. And if it's wet, yep. I never throw it back. Yep. <laughs> oh, the catcher messed that one up. <laughs> so we're going to quick talk here. When the catcher's hit by a foul ball, and I probably should have put when, when we get hit by a foul ball, um, I'm going to just add, nope, this is not a foul tip. Um, if you're wondering why, go look in the definitions of your rule book. Um, <laughs> thanks, Russ. Uh, so when a catcher's hit by a foul ball, what, what do we do? Well, as we said before, catchers are umpire lifesavers. They are literally stopping a projectile from hitting us. Okay. I will give the catcher as much time as they need, unless it's blatantly obvious they need to be removed from this game to get their bearings back. Because I don't want the next pitch to come in and smoke me. Uh, Cause then that's going to make for, especially if it's cold, that's going to make for an even longer day uh, than what, what we quote unquote signed up for. So when a catcher gets hit by a foul ball, okay, obviously we're going to call time, okay? Um, I'm going to walk the ball out to the pitcher. Um, if you've ever had a pre Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute, Jake. Okay. If the catcher gets hit by a foul ball, why are you going to call time? It's a foul. Well, Connor, I can see the wheel spinning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, I know where you're going with this because I, I just I dug myself in a hole, but I'll, I'll dig out. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> Put the shovel down. Oh, okay. Walk the ball. You walk the ball to the pitcher. Yep. I've had great success with walking the ball to the pitcher somewhat slowly. They all know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I'll say to the pitcher, I'll say to the pitcher, Ryan looks like a pretty tough kid, but look over my shoulder. Is he shaking up or is he good to go? And if the if if and when the pitcher looks at me like I he's stunned, like he has no concept of what I'm asking, I'll just repeat it because they're pitchers after all. So I'll just say, "Hey, Ryan looks like a pretty tough kid, but he got hit hard. How's he doing back there?" And you'll usually get the, "Oh, he's a tough bastard. He'll be fine." That, that's nice, but it's not really the question I was asking you, but okay. So I'll turn around and I'll leave. That's my, that's my approach to um, dealing with him getting hit. That sounds like the art of umpiring. Absolutely. That is some, something similar, something similar to what I use. Uh, 
but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's give the catcher a minute. And by a minute, I mean, I don't mean 60 seconds. Give him, give him enough time to get his bearings back. I mean, both especially sets. With, what? I said both sets, his bearings. Yeah. So give him enough time to get, get his bearings back. Uh, always, always, always brush the plate off. I don't care if you're on curve. I don't care how silly it looks. Brush the plate off. Okay. When a catcher gets hit, Russ is absolutely correct. Everybody knows what we're doing when we walk out and talk to the pitcher. Okay. There, everybody knows what's going on. Okay. So do it and make sure you don't rush your catcher back and don't be in a hurry to put the ball back in play. Because at the end of the day, the catcher is the only thing stopping a projectile from hitting you. Okay. Now, the, the, the short and sweet version of what I expect when I meet the unfortunate side of a baseball is I'm going to hand the catcher a baseball and they're going to walk out to the mound and they're going to discuss the price of tea in China. Doesn't matter. I, I, don't, I really don't care what they talk about. Give me enough time to get my bearings back because if you want, I mean, I can't call strikes if, you know, my arm is throbbing. Like, well, at least give me, give me a minute. Um, you know, and most catchers, they do it automatically. I mean, I, shoot, I, I've even taken some shots where I'm bent over and I've literally just had a catcher reach into my ball bag and grab a baseball and go. Uh, so Russ, Larry, Connor, any thoughts or comments on that? Um, I think that I've kind of gone away from that every time the catcher gets hit, go out. Um, partially because of the attitude of catchers sometimes. And it's something that I talk to them in the first inning and just say, hey, if you, if you take a shot, I said, if you get hit, I'm going to ask you. Obviously, when they get hit hard, you, you know when they get hit, right? Common sense, when they need it. Other than that, I'm, I'm going to ask them. Because sometimes they're like, you know, I had it this weekend where my partner tried to walk a baseball out, and the catcher's like, no, give me the damn baseball. He was pissed off at his pitcher and wanted to throw it back. Um. But, you know, I ask, and I'm like, if you need a breather, just say, just tell me. I'm, I'm going to ask you. If you say no, I'm going to give you a baseball. If you say you're good, I'm going to give you a baseball, and we're going to play. Um, but I think that's something where everybody's a little different. Obviously, you're going to be able to tell when they need it, when they need a second, as opposed to, like, a glancing blow. But sometimes those glancing blows are to sensitive areas, and they need a quick second. And I take the time, to, you know, to walk the baseball out there. But it also kind of depends on the level, too, I think. Um, the higher up you go, the – I don't want to say the tougher they are, but the mentality gets a little different. Um, and they want, to, they want to baseball and they want to play. Um, so it's really worked well for me, and I've had catchers appreciate that. I haven't had anybody be like, oh, you're a, you're a jerk for not giving me a second to breathe. Um, but it's what works for me. Uh, each situation is in and of itself different. Remember, when you get hit sometimes, they want to walk out too with a, with, a, with a new ball. But there's many times you don't want that. You want to get the game going because you didn't get hurt. Right. So treat each situation as you can read the situation. Perfect. All right. Catchers, love to ask the question, where is that pitch, Blue? Um, they, they frame pitches. They use the, the, they, uh, call it the art of framing a pitch. Um, this is a gif of a friend of mine, Brian Henry, who had, um, knowledge that I was going to use this clip. Thanks, Brian. Um, this is the championship game of the little league world series. And we got the pitcher walking off the mound. We got the catcher holding it for a very, very long time. Okay. Uh, something that probably is gonna, something that's probably gonna irk us um, a little bit. Okay. Oh. All right, and then you're also gonna get the quite, you know, they're gonna ask you rather than just you know 
holding the glove there saying you screwed up. Um, like in the previous clip, uh, they'll ask, you know, Hey, where's that pitch at? So we'll watch this quick video here. Um, this is Larry for your reference. This is the twins catcher getting dumped. Um, a couple years ago, forget, I forget which catcher it was, but that's the video. I guarantee you Jerry Lane did not egg him in to an ejection. Okay. So catchers, you know, they, they can ask questions and you should answer all reasonable questions. Okay. If it's the first inning and they've already asked you where that pitch is nine times. Okay. No. I, I'm that that's not getting an answer from me. That's going to get something like throw the ball back. You, you know where that pitch is at. Okay. But you know, once a couple times a game, you know, Hey, where'd you have that at? Batters will ask that question too. Okay. And in most situations, a catcher is just in his crouch and Hey, hey Connor, where'd you have that pitch at? I had I had that I had that off the plate. Okay, thanks. Don't uh, forget to teach him that you never end a, a statement or a question with a preposition. <laughs> That's an old joke. Larry, weren't you a gym teacher? Yeah, but I got good grades in English too. <laughs> and, and in fact, in my classes. If you misspell the word, you got a half a point off. Well, fair enough. So a catcher should not turn around on you. But this is this is very, very age specific. If, if, I'm, if I'm out working a 13U game or a 14U game, low level JV game even, and they turn around, okay, whatever. Varsity game. I'm definitely going to say something to him, but just, hey, keep your head forward. I'll, I'll answer your question, but don't don't turn around on me, please. Okay. Um, at the lower levels, I'm going to explain why they shouldn't do it, but that's going to be a couple pitches, probably a couple batters later. Um, I put down here, keep it professional. Okay. You don't say it was, you know, it was high. Okay, it's up. It's not low, it's down. In, up, low, in, out, down, or off. Okay. Um, typically, what I found is that a lot of batters will ask, they won't ask where you have that pitch, but they're going to ask more zone related questions. And so a batter will say, Hey, Jake, is that the lowest we're going today? Yes. <laughs> or is that the bottom? Yes. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> That's my standard answer. I'd, I'd, I'd be careful with that, um, with telling him, yes, it's the bottom, because you get the next pitch or a similar pitch in their mind's eye that they think is lower, and then they can snap back and say, well, you told me that was the bottom a couple of pitches ago. Now you're going lower. Um, I would suggest that you – find to use Larry's term, the art of umpiring mm -hmm. or more properly find the art of saying something without saying anything at all. Um, if they ask, is that the bottom? That's a good pitch or that's right there. You're acknowledging their question, mm -hmm. telling them that's a good pitch, but you're leaving it entirely open-ended. And open ended is best because then you're not boxing yourself. You're not boxing yourself into something. That's an excellent point. 
my standard answer is, I don't know, I haven't decided yet. Which is similar, but it all depends on yeah. situations too. If they've been on yeah. me all game, I'm not going to use that because clearly they know I haven't decided yet or they feel like I haven't decided yet if they're on me all game about it. I think First time inning, of, ninth inning stuff. I think time of game has a lot to do with how you respond. Yep. So, 100%, so Russ, Larry. Russ, to, to further your point then, so it, and, and get, in, get in with Larry on the, on the time of game. So talking on a, on a later game question, I mean, that's been there all day. Is, is that something that would, would still leave it open-ended or yes? If it's late in the game, you can say, I've seen that pitch before and that's the same pitch I've called a strike before or a ball yeah. before, depending on who has it. That's I'm just a big to... fan of, yeah. I'm a big fan of saying something, but not saying anything at all. It just, it just doesn't, it doesn't come back to bite you. That's a good pitch. Yeah. I can't, I can't take that pitch away from him. Mm -hmm. I've got to get that one. Your pitcher wants me to get that one too. <laughs> That pitch is why I'm here. It's a yeah, good one. You get that one too. That's a that's a really good one. Yep. I see. I, I don't. I, I don't make. I don't make my money on the bouncing ball in the dirt. <laughs> so, when you have a catcher that turns around on you, or wants to get obnoxious with asking the question, or in this video case, just sticks and holds the pitch there. Uh, my old friend Brian does exactly what uh, what you should do, uh, which if we watch this clip, you'll see that Brian will call time, pull out his plate brush, and doesn't matter if it's turf. This is, uh, if you were at the Corn Belt meeting in, 20, in the spring of, I guess, last Connor, was it last year that we talked about this? I think so. The, the, so last year at our at our in-person meeting, which probably was about a year ago today, um, we talked about handling part in part handling catchers and you know how the plate brush is a tool. Okay. Now this is obviously a dirt. And look, I mean the plate is is as white as it normally is. I mean, it is a perfectly clean plate. There is, you know, from an observer's view, there's no reason to go and brush the plate off. Well, it's no different than pulling out your lineup card when a coach comes out to talk about something. You brush the plate off, tell the catcher, hey, knock that off. Or whatever this, whatever the situation warrants. Um, you know, that's so using the plate brush, I mean, this is this is a very good use of the plate brush. I mean, th this is, I think, I think Larry would agree that this falls into the category of the art of umpiring. Um, you know, we're, we're diffusing a situation here um, or a potential situation, and then we're moving on. Connor, Russ, Larry, thoughts, comments? It's, it's just one of our tools. The game's yeah. changed a bit in the time since I've started umpiring. Um, there's been a time where at some levels when this happens, it's a, from now for the rest of the game, I'm not calling a pitch until you throw it back. And then. I like that. I mean, I've done that. The coach, Connor, is that a ball or a strike? I don't know. He hasn't thrown it back yet. And then. Coach yells at the catcher, throw it back so we can call it. Or I'll tell the catcher when, when they ask, is that a ball or a strike? I don't know yet. You haven't thrown it back. I'm working on my timing. <laughs> <laughs> saying something without saying something, right? Yeah. I mean, at, at the higher levels, I'm not calling a pitch until you throw it back from now on. 
Yeah, I like that a lot. Stance. And I just, I'll just hang out in my stance and just. Because it, it and another, and here's it. Jerk about it. So let's go along those lines. I love that idea, Connor. So let's take it one step farther because I think the rules would support us doing that. In college baseball, we have a 20 second action clock. And the pitcher or the catcher is to return the pitch, the ball, to the pitcher in a timely manner, right from the rule book. If he's not going to do that in a timely manner, I'm starting the clock. I'm point, I'm going to get my, uh, uh, you know, get get at some point in time, I'm going to get in contact with my base umpire and go, hey, he keeps doing this. We're going to start the clock. And if we have to be there 20 seconds to give him a ball, so be it. Here's another thing with the college rule. Can't do it in high school because it's a little different. Remember, anytime a defensive player meets with the pitcher or another defensive player, we're going to uh, count that as one of the trips, the defensive conferences of the six. So yep. don't we sometimes send catchers out to tell the pitcher not to show up the umpire like that pitcher did? He, 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 he did a, a deal with his head and he didn't do anything with his arms, but he did with his head. So we're going to use one of your uh, trips. Go ahead. Because, you know, the guy's holding the ball too long on you. The pitcher showed up, the umpire. I want you to use one of your trips. If you don't, I'm going to start counting it as one. You know, you can go that far. Now, you're going to cause some real problems with doing it. But it's a last resort, I think. Yeah. It is a last resort. And remember, um, they're not they're not allowed to argue time, especially in college baseball. It again, specifically spells out. They're not al allowed to argue uh, the application of times. They can ask, you know, what's he doing, but they're not allowed, certainly not allowed to leave their position to argue. It's a warning and ejection. Catch the ball, throw the ball, be done with it. You know, and it, I think it depends on also what level and what season. But sometimes, I don't know. You tell me where that's at. And it all kind of depends on who you are and how much or how you can address it. Um, because I've had times in amateur games where I'm like, I don't know. You tell me. You're like, huh? That's your job. Okay, let me do it then. Now we're on the same page. Exactly. And it all, I mean, there's no perfect way to handle it. It's all going to be your no. personality and how you get away with it or, or not how you get away with it, but what you feel like, you can, what you know you can defend and get away with um, and what's going to work for you more importantly. And what's going to work for me is going to work for Jake. Um, I have biceps. He doesn't. I'm a little more, you know, he, he's <laughs> a seven, but like my fingers are as big as his arms. So yeah, but he, hi and he hides behind the, the flagpole. Exactly. Still, my that is still my favorite line from an evaluation I ever got was do bicep curls. But you know everybody's different. That, that's the art of umpiring, and that's really what we're talking about today. Is everybody's going to handle it differently, and what works for you isn't going to work for somebody else. And but, you're going to find out some of these things won't work for you that time, and you're going to have to go to plan <laughs> B, C, and D. But. Try different stuff because you don't know what works until you find out it doesn't. And so the things to yeah. do in your toolbox and get rid of the other ones. And you'll find out really quick what doesn't. <laughs> so Russ and Connor and, and Larry, I'm going to, I had a situation this past weekend. Okay. And give me your thoughts on this situation. I'm going to like this, this worked for me and it's worked multiple times in the past. And so it's one of the things that I do, um, but partially for my own benefit, but for everyone else's benefit too, just I'll, I'll talk through it and then give kind of feedback and other strategies for a situation like this. Okay. Cause it's a, it's a routine situation that most umpires probably have a couple times a season. Okay. So, um, 
had a pitch that I had right at the hollow of the kneecap. I thought my, I thought my timing was pretty good, and I struck the pitch. It was right down the middle of the plate within the stop sign. So I, I struck it. Um, catcher comes back out, top half of the next inning, or whichever half of the next inning was, I don't even remember now, um, and says, you know, hey, I, I'm going to remember that pitch. And I said, I said, you've already gotten that. I said, I gave your pitcher that pitch. I'm going to give their pitcher that pitch. Okay. You'll get that pitch again. Uh, but we're not going to have this, you know, we're, we're not going to have this back here today. That's, that's not going to happen. Got him talked off the ledge. Didn't have to give him a ball strike warning, you know, just talked him off the ledge and we played baseball. Uh, got through that inning, no issues. Got through the, uh, his offense, the, his team's half of the inning, no issues. By that point in time, um, the trainer had come out with water. My partner and I had gotten together. And I had said, uh, I had asked my partner because he was in, in the uh, C position, right-handed batter. I said, hey, did you have that pitch low that everyone was barking about? He said, yeah, I had it low. So like, it wasn't by much, but it was low. I said, okay. I said, did he pick it up out of the dirt? He said, no, he did not pick it up out of the dirt. I said, okay. Um, so, cat, so, catcher meets me back behind home plate and he said, Hey, that was my bad. Uh, you know, you know, I'm sorry. And I said, Hey, you know what? We're good. Uh, you know, I asked my partner, I missed it. Okay. Partner said it was low. I'm sorry. That's, you know, where we're at. All right. We're going to move on now. Now that, that was the extent of our conversation. We didn't have an issue for the rest of the game. I've known this catcher. He's been in this conference for three years. I've had him numerous times. I have a very good rapport with this catcher. And I knew that I could, you know, say that and it would not be held against me later on. Okay. So Russ Connor, go for it. This is a lot smarter than me. So I'm going to let him talk last because he usually carries more weight. <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> I think it, it, it depends, you know, on um, the situation where, where you have that catcher. I'm probably not going to wait that long to address it. I'm probably going to say something about saying something. Like when, when he comes out and says, I'm going to remember that pitch. I'm like, you know, depending on how I feel about that pitch, personally, it's going to be different. How, how, I, how I feel about it is going to be different than how I address it. It could be something where I'm like, you know, Billy, you really thought that was down? Yeah, man, I, I thought it was a really good pitch, but I'll take I'll slow my timing down and get a better look at it next time. Or if it's a pitch where I know that it was probably down, I'll say, you know, I thought it was a really good pitch, but it might have been down. He's gonna say, yeah, it was okay. Just remember that now that we've established that, that pitch is a low, I can't give it to you either now. And then I usually get to, if it's a catcher that I know really well. And that usually addresses it. If I know it's a strike, Billy, that's a good pitch, and your guy wants that too, and I'm going to give it to him. And that usually solves And then if you go get it, more importantly, that usually solves that issue. If I know it's there. Russ, so, something I'm working on is, is being more aggressive in the strike zone. And I heard this from a AAA guy that I know um, call it until they really start screaming at you. And then, and then maybe, maybe you got to work it back up or in the high strike case, work it back down a shade, but call it until they really start screaming at you. Obviously don't go nuts. Um, if the way you handle that Jake works great for you, um, then who am I to tell you it doesn't work? You know, um, if it works great for you, it works great for you. <clears throat> um, you. The whole concept behind this is you have to find the things that work to deal with the personality that's in front of you. And sometimes you got to do that on the fly real quick. 
Um, so have lots of tools in that box. Um, and don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try something new as long as you know, you're going to be a professional about it. And that's, I, I, I think that goes without saying, but I think the, the folks on this call are all in that, uh, in that realm anyway. So why would we, you know, we don't have to reinvent that wheel for sure. So I have a question. Go for it. You know, uh, Jake, you got me reading that book, the stuff that nobody told you. And in that book, you know, I had heard you say you're talking to your partner in between innings and it says, you know, you need to limit, you know, your chats every half an inning. I mean, impossible if you're working with Matt Sisk, but uh, you know, it says, especially if it's a controversial call that you, you know, you, you never want to talk because it shows weakness that you're out there saying, Hey buddy, did I get this right or wrong? You know? So I guess leading off of that, you went and asked your partner, what do you guys feel about chatting at the half inning mark, you know, in between right. innings type deal? All right. All right. I'm going to take first crack of this here. Okay. So first and foremost, um, the book is, or the, the, the list that you are reading is, is true to some point. Okay. Now there are, um, certain officials that, um, are excellent teachers. They have a lot of knowledge to share and at lower levels, it is completely appropriate in my opinion to get together, um, because I mean, I, I was one of the people that was under the Matt Sisk learning tree and I learned a lot from him because we were able to get together between every inning. If he and I go work a varsity game or a, a college game, we're not getting together unless, you know, we have a situation that warrants it. Okay. Um, now, as far as a controversial aspect of it, um, as I had said before, the, uh, we, had, we had had a whole half inning go by. Okay. So perception is reality. Reality is perception. Okay. As far as the, the camera is concerned and everybody else that's watching, my partner and I could have been saying, Hey, nice, you know, Hey, nice call there. Um, there, and, and there wasn't, you know, there weren't any real players within earshot of us. And it was just a simple, Hey, yes or yes or no question. Um, and so I, to further elaborate on, on what it is on the, the, the writing that you're referring to, Jay, um, the one of the worst possible things you can do is immediately get together with your partner after a controversial call. If you punch a kid out for the third out of an inning and everybody is going nuts, as soon if I'm the base umpire, as soon as I know that the, the situation has died, I am getting out of there. Okay, because what, what you had said is absolutely correct. The, the perception is if you get together right away after a, a blown call like that, or not, I shouldn't say blown call, but after a controversial call like that, um, it, it, it can show um, un, not uh, unconfidence um, in, a, in a call. Um, I will say that the higher up you go, the less frequent you should get together. Um, you know, if I'm working with, if I'm working a, an amateur game with Connor, I mean, we might get together once in nine innings. Unless I'm bored. Cause it's amateur baseball. That's, that's, that's <laughs> and fair. unless you need it, Jake. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the thing that I would caution against with the, the reading of, that piece of literature is it, it, it really puts umpiring into a black and white, you know, you should never get together with your umpire or with your partner. Um, no, that that's, I, I don't agree with that statement. Um, you should not be getting together at, at each half inning. Um, but it was the, you know, we got together once that entire play job. Um, so, you know, I don't, I, I don't think any supervisor and, and it was like middle of the game too. So it wasn't like it was like the first or second inning. Uh, 
So there, there's not much of a, I don't think there's much of a concern with getting together, you know, if it's once or twice a game, um, especially when it's, you know, we're, we're both grabbing a drink of water um, and we were in front of the same dugout. So. Um, meet for a purpose. You know, obviously have, have a reason why you're meeting and don't meet directly after a call that's going to piss somebody off. You can always pregame signals if you want to communicate if a pitch was a good at a good spot or not. Um, we do that occasionally where we might have something where, you know, inside hip versus outside hip or something. I don't I don't know. Everybody's a little different, but something discreet um, on a nut cutter. Um, but get together as often as you as necessary, and not directly after a a call that's going to make people upset. Coaches always say, you know, hey, next pitch, next pitch. If you think you blew a call, next pitch. That's that's the best piece of advice I can give on a on a on a play that is either hotly contested or that you know you may have quote unquote blown. Uh, next pitch. You know, we can talk about it after the, after the game in the parking lot, or if there's a convenient opportunity, there's a purpose. Um, I like how Connor phrased that then yeah, you can ask, but gotta be next pitch. Okay, thanks guys. I apologize, I gotta run. I, I was gonna wait for the response. I got a one o'clock, uh, another call I gotta get on. I apologize. Thanks for the response on that guys. Absolutely. See you guys, yep. Um, it is one o'clock, we're gonna probably wrap up here. Um, but does anybody else have any uh, questions? That was, a, that was a great question. Uh, you got any other questions before we uh, sign off? Have a great week, boys. Good yep, to see all of you. Week. Yeah, if you 